Welcome to Patriarchy from the boardroom to the bedroom. I am Amy McPhee Olivest. I have been debating about how real to get on this topic. Very real. Very real. Okay, good. That's what I went with. I decided to be very real with you, so we're just not going to hold back at all. So as you see, I have a husband and four kids, three girls and a boy. That photo was taken in 2009. Um, two years after my husband graduated from the business school at Stanford. We come from a very traditional patriarchal faith tradition where the members are told to get married young and have kids young and the man will work and the wife will stay at home with the kids and we did that. I took that to heart and I love my kids more than anything in the whole world. I still do, of course. And also, I had a big old feminist awakening and that led me to 13 years after this photo was taken, my own graduation with my master's So that was just two years ago, and I actually, putting it in the presentation, I cried again in my room when I was doing it. Um, really, really special to me. One thing that happened during my master's degree is that I, the system of patriarchy just like kept coming to my mind. I needed to understand it. I wanted to understand every aspect of it, everywhere in the world, and how it came to be. And I couldn't find any classes to take, not at Stanford, not at Berkeley. I was looking for PhD programs. I couldn't find anything online, really, that was like an online course, and I had never taken a women's studies program. So I decided to educate myself. I bought 20 books at first, and I took detailed notes, and I was talking to friends, and they're like, listen, if you're doing all of this research, can you just talk in a microphone? Because we don't have time to read these books. I was like, okay. So I invited friends to read the books with me, and we discussed them while we were talking into microphones, kind of like you would in a grad school seminar, right? You read the same book, and then you have an intellectual and emotional discussion about it. And so then we decided to turn those conversations into a podcast. So the podcast is now in its fourth season. At first, I was just talking to my friends. Now I'm super excited. I get to talk to the authors of these books and thought leaders in the world. And I get to interview people like Mickey Kendall and Kate Mann. Um, so it's, you can find it at Breaking Down Patriarchy on Apple or Spotify if you don't know about it yet. Um, and our Instagram handle is at Be Down Patriarchy. We, our Instagram isn't as big as we, f we focus most of our we meaning me. <laughs> I focus my energy mostly into the, the podcast. But super exciting announcement also, this week we started a YouTube channel, and this is a we with Ralph Blair, who's sitting right here, um, my fantastic videographer. So what we did was go back through the seasons and get the most exciting and mind-blowing and life-changing content from the podcast. And Ralph helped me turn it into super entertaining, snappy videos that you can share with your dad, or you can share with your husband, or you can share with your brother. Because sometimes they won't listen to a whole hour podcast, or they just don't listen to podcasts, right? A lot of boys and men, the demographic is that they tend to watch their content on YouTube and they want it short. And that's what we did. So go to YouTube, and it's at Breaking Down Patriarchy. And like, subscribe, and share. We just started, we launched it like three days ago, I think, maybe four days ago. So it's brand new and we are stoked. So share it with all the men in your life. That's what I do. For the presentation today, we're gonna have four parts. The first one is an intro. What is patriarchy and how does it work? And then we're gonna do historical context. I am trained as a historian, so I can't not do historical context to get the foundations first, and then we'll talk about patriarchy in the boardroom, and then patriarchy in the bedroom. So first, what is patriarchy? If I'm ever gonna have a conversation on a topic that might be emotional or might be controversial, I think it's super important first to agree on the definition, because otherwise you can be talking past each other, because you have something very different in your head than your conversation partner does. So, actually, before we do that, I want you to turn to the person next to you, try to define patriarchy in one sentence, just really quickly. First thing that comes to your mind. Okay. Okay, could you do it? Was it was it hard to sum it up? It's kind of hard, right? Okay. Here's the dictionary. I literally go to the dictionary. If I'm having a tricky conversation, if I have my phone in my pocket, just look it up. Okay, that's the standard definition. So we sometimes we try to pretend a word doesn't mean what it actually means. It means what the dictionary says it does, right? Okay, so the patriarchy is a system of society or government in which the father, patriarchy, um, that's the patriarchy, like padre in Spanish, it comes from Greek and then Latin. 
The father or eldest male is the head of the family and descent is traced through the male line, or it's a system of society or government in which men hold the power and women are largely excluded from it. That's the archy, like monarchy, mono, one person, archy, one person ruling, father ruling. The way that it works in society now is that when a little boy is born by virtue of being male, he inherits a birthright of status and centrality, like being kind of the default human in the world. That's the status that he inherits upon being born. That's what patriarchy means. Okay, so how does patriarchy work? I want to illustrate this with a story, uh, a true story. That's Virginia Woolf, if you don't recognize her. So it's 1931. Women in England have had the vote for three years. They got the vote in 1928, eight years after we did. Uh, Virginia Woolf was a very well-known author and thought leader in England at the time, and she was asked to give a talk to young women who were entering the workforce. They said, your topic is professions for women. And she goes to the conference and she sees all of these bright-eyed young women who are able to enter the workforce in ways that women never had been able to before. And she says, okay, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna be able to give you the talk that you're expecting. Because everybody's talking about how great it is we can vote now. It's so great we can work. We have all these new jobs that are available to us. That is great. But everybody's saying that the playing field is even now. And it's not. And here's why. Because the next battle we're all going to have to fight is our customs, our traditions, our habits, our own minds. The patriarchy that lives in all of our minds because we've been doing it this way for literally thousands of years. And I love this story because it kind of illustrates this concept of the, provo the proverbial elephant. Do you know this? Um, I actually don't know if it's literally true, but where, if you, it is true. Okay, so if you tie an elephant to a stake, first of all, the first thing is sometimes the elephant is actually strong enough to pull the stake out, out but doesn't know it. But here's the thing that happens. It gets used to the radius that it's able to travel, and then you can take the stake out, and it won't leave it because its limitations have mapped in its own mind, right? You don't even need the stake anymore. We don't even need the laws anymore sometimes, right? It, all we can envision is what our parents told us and what we saw our grandparents do. That's all we can envision for ourselves. We don't even need this the patriarchy thing, right? Like sometimes when people say the patriarchy, we picture, this is an AI generated image, can you tell? <laughs> like this, this very menacing group of like men in a boardroom. I think that's what we kind of picture. Like there's the patriarchy somewhere that's like making it so women are subservient. I mean, does that exist? Arguably, maybe in some, in some places it does. But most of the patriarchy I've encountered in my real life are from really nice men that I know, and some of, sometimes men that love me, women that love me, right? Sometimes like the, the harshest patriarchy is from women. Sometimes the limitations, the patriarchal limitations are from me in my own mind. So that's why I passed out the papers. You may notice there's a paper on your seat. I hope you have a pen or a pencil because I'd love you to take notes. This is a way of, of kind of mapping how we relate to the world from the most inner, innermost part of ourselves, our thoughts, our self, to our families. And within family, that's where we would put partnership and, and patriarchy in the bedroom, right? Our partnerships. At, so family and then out to community, things like church and school. That's where we'll put the workplace. So patriarchy in the boardroom is in the community. Then it goes out to the nation and then to all humanity. We encounter these systems in all of these different concentric circles. So take notes, if you, if you will, um, and put them, like maybe like you can draw arrows and stuff to where they belong. And just write down anything you think comes, comes up. Oh, and then I'm hosting a meetup at 5 o'clock. And you can rope in friends even that aren't here. Bring your notes to the meetup. I'm going to be talking pretty much the whole time now. At the meetup, I want to hear what your thoughts are. What are your pain points and what are your solutions? We'll crowdsource wisdom from the group at five o'clock. So bring these notes at five. And I actually don't even know where my meetup is. <laughs> Hopefully we can. I think everybody's watching at the pool. pool. At the pool? Take your pool. Find yeah. me at the pool. I'll try to make myself taller so you can find me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I know. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna, now historical context, part one. And when I say historical, I mean way, way, way back. 
the evidence and the consensus among everything I've researched and read says that originally our human ancestors were not patriarchal. We were egalitarian, everybody worked together, there was no inherited status based on any biological trait. Everybody worked together. But by the time humans were writing records in Mesopotamia, by the time that happened, so when we have real evidence of like, here's what we think, these are our laws, it's already firmly entrenched. Patriarchy has already been around for a while. You can see it, you can hear it in the laws that the men have centered themselves. They are kings and priests and they are making rules for the women. Here's what women are allowed to do and here's what they aren't allowed to do. And you see a lot of laws, one of the themes is which types of violence are husbands allowed to do to their wives and which types of violence have to be enacted by the state. So for example, in Middle Assyrian laws, we're talking a long, long, long time ago. If a woman speaks against a man, it is legal to crush her mouth with a brick. Here's another one. If a woman causes her own abortion, then she is executed by impalement, and it's, you can't bury her body. That's the harshest punishment in Middle Assyrian law. And that's what happens to a woman who causes her own abortion. Meanwhile, if a man doesn't want a child, he can commit infanticide. He can leave that child out in the elements to die, and it's not even illegal. And here's why. Because men owned women's bodies. And women's bodies, the product of women's bodies was children. Men owned their children. So it was an affront to the patriarchal state for a woman to say, I get to make that choice. That's a man's choice, so she was executed, okay? I mean, the relevance even to, to today, whether that is a woman's right, her husband's right, or the state's right, we're still making those choices about what we wanna do as societies about that issue, right? Okay, the other place that we see patriarchy early, early on is in religion. And this is a tender topic, I know, it's tender to me also. So whatever the beliefs are of everybody in this room, this is a safe place for you to believe whatever you believe. And there's a spiritual aspect to religion. What I'm gonna ask for you to do right now is just put on a historian's hat and think about religion in terms of what are the foundations? How did religious law affect le the legal codes of the state and the cultural norms? So if we can do a little bit of scholarly remove from the, the heart of religion and just look at it as historians. So what we see are Ancient religions full of goddesses, goddesses everywhere, and gods too, gods and goddesses everywhere, but then eventually being replaced by just one male god. And you can see this in creation stories, right? These are all European artists from various centuries um, depicting the creation story of the Judeo-Christian tradition, the yeah, Judeo-Christian tradition. If you look at comparative religions all around the world, every creation story has a goddess, right? Like, I mean, goddesses create life, right? But this is a story where it's just one man and no feminine presence in sight creating the world. It's, it's unusual for humans to conceive of creation that way without a woman. So God creates the first human, one dude, <laughs> the man named Adam, and then he asks, is it good for man to be alone? And the answer is, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And so he takes it, this is a familiar story, right? Takes the rib and makes Eve as a helper. Okay. So then we all know the story, right? Then the serpent tempts Eve. She takes the forbidden fruit. She tempts Adam. He takes the fruit. And then they all get in trouble, right? And it said, God, to the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit from the tree, and then many cursings follow after that. Okay, so I just want to say here, there are there's a whole huge body of feminist religious literature that wrestle with this and contend with this and kind of um, <laughs> claim spiritual sovereignty in their own religious tradition. Okay, I just want to say, we talk about it on the podcast. We'll listen to the podcast. There are wonderful books I can recommend. But in terms of how this impacted our laws and our customs, we ended up with so many, and I just had to choose one for today. And the one I chose is the laws of coverture. 
So this comes from middle ages, from the Middle Ages in France, and it just means covering. So the man covers the woman. From France it went to England, and from England it went to the United States when they were writing the Constitution and they had a chance to remake a whole new system and they kept the laws of coverture and didn't write women into the Constitution. It just makes me live it. Anyway, with the laws of coverture, the way it said it in the law is that when a man and woman got married, they become one and that one is the husband. That's not an interpretation, that's what the law said. That one is the husband, okay? So that also meant that women upon marriage were rendered civilly dead. They didn't have any rights. They didn't have the right to their own wages. If they worked, they became the husband's wages. They didn't own the clothes on their backs. They didn't own their birthday presents. They didn't own their children if they got divorced. So that kept a lot of women from getting divorced, right? They didn't own their children. Um, it also kept women from voting and signing contracts and being able to get credit and all of the, the list of rights that we know have been won like in the 20th century, the 19th and 20th century. That's where this comes from, is the laws of coverture. Okay. The laws of coverture and this, this tradition also brought us to systems of government. When we say patriarchal, <laughs> that's what we're talking about, where we have this. Uh, so here's the funny thing. We're so used to this, right? Like we've seen this image so many times that we almost don't notice it. One of my favorite techniques for getting people to like see things with new eyes is to just flip it. What if the last few presidents had looked like that? <laughs> right? <laughs> like let it sink in, isn't it kind of awesome? Like Obama, like he's a stunner, like you know, right? Carter? I mean, I love this. I, I, I actually really love it. So sometimes when we flip it, it can make us laugh. It can make us offended. But it shocks us out of the familiar, right? And helps us see, like, oh my gosh. Whoa. We are so used to this, we don't even notice it. Right? What would it feel like to be a girl growing up with that if you go to the Smithsonian and you see the Hall of the Presidents? What would it feel like to be a little boy growing up and you go to the Smithsonian and see that in the Hall of the Presidents? It would be different. It would be different. So don't let anybody gaslight you into thinking like, oh, there's no sexism anymore. Flip it. Okay, so now we've arrived at the boardroom. How have you experienced patriarchy in the boardroom or in the workplace? Take a second and maybe jot down a note with just a couple of sentences. Okay. It's killing me to not be able to, like, I'm a teacher, I love classroom participation, but I just did the presentation to, like, I'm packing it in. So please come to the meetup, and I would love to hear what you wrote down. Um, just keep writing, um, and then maybe we can share afterwards, too, if there's time. Okay, so I wanted to start out with that historical context, because if you imagine that it's been the way we just kind of, the, the timeline that we just walked through, what would we expect it to look like in 2024? I mean, we might expect it to look like what it looks like, right? What does it look like? So if you look at the top 10, um, if you look at concentration of wealth, the top 10 richest people in the world are these men. If you expand it to, should I use a mic now? Can you yes. hear me? Okay, no worries. It was smaller before, so yeah, I'm happy to, I'm happy to use a mic. I'll just keep talking a minute and then when it picks up, it picks up. I don't think it's... I, he said it'll be it's 10 seconds while it warms up. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Oh, there we go. Better? There we go. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No problem. Okay, so if you, if you expand this to the top 20 richest people in the world, there are three women. All of them inherited their wealth. One from a father, one from a husband, and then Mackenzie Bezos from an ex-husband, right? Um, this was an interesting headline recently in, I think this was Forbes, women CEOs run more than 10% of the Fortune 500 companies for the first time in history crossed the threshold of 10%. That's actually super exciting. That's really great progress and it's happened pretty quick. And it also means that 90% of the Fortune 500 are run 
by men. And that matters because money matters. Unfortunately, in this world, money does matter, and it's not fair. It also matters because CEOs of companies determine culture. And if those huge companies are determining culture that is trickling down to the entire like ecosphere of, of workplaces in our country, right? With men at the head. It's creating this situation where the US is the only industrialized country that doesn't provide paid maternity leave. Most women go back to work two weeks after having a baby. The US is the wealthiest nation that puts the least money into childcare. 40% of parents are in debt because of the cost of childcare. And the parent, the, the impact of having a child is completely different for men and women. Men make 6% more for every child they have, while women make 4% less for each child. So whereas you have a wealth gap or you have a wage gap already, it widens and compounds for every child you have and over time accrues and it just does this. And so speaking of the wage gap, I mean, I know everybody looks at the wage gap, but I'm just gonna touch on it really quickly. So here, this top line, 100%, this is the average for a white man in America. This orange line, if you can see it, this is actually Asian women. This black line or dark blue is white women. This light blue line is black women, and this is Hispanic women. So this tracks from 1988 to this dotted line was 2020, and then here are projections. So one of the pieces of data that I find on this graph that's really disheartening is how flat these are right here. That's for me probably the most concerning piece, that, that for Hispanic women are not projected to reach wage equity until 2451 at the rate we're going, okay? So that's to me like super, super discouraging and something that everybody needs to pay attention to. But I have a heartening story. I don't know if you know the story of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, but I'm gonna tell you really quickly because there's some really great lessons to learn from it. So the Boston Symphony Orchestra, like every symphony, was all male in the early 20th century. But Boston being the progressive city it's always been. From Boston, Boston yeah. repping in the back, awesome. Um, 1952, this is pretty early, and they decided that it was not fair that the Boston Symphony Orchestra was all male. Thanks, Ralph, that would be great. Um, he'll just go let them know that we're doing serious stuff in here. So, I know, like come in and help us, help us break it down. Um, oh, that's funny, Ralph will tell me. Send the white guy. Um, I mean, so anyway, okay, so 1952, the Boston Symphony Orchestra, there's no law against women being in the symphony, but they're noticing that they're not hiring women. So they decide to confront their bias and they decide to institute blind auditions, okay, for the first time. Good for them, right? I actually love this story because thank you male allies. There are certain things still in this world that we can't do because we do not have access to the levers of power and we rely on male allies. Thank you, ma'am, for being in here, right? <laughs> Seriously, that's a big part of my work, is building bridges and helping to educate men, because we have to do it together. Anyway, okay, so they decide to have blind auditions. So the judges turn their seats to the back, the musician walks in and auditions, and so they hold these auditions, and at the end, they select all men again. And this was really discouraging, because the narrative at the time was, women just aren't as good as musicians as men are. Maybe it's because they're smarter, maybe it's because they're bigger and stronger, they have more lung capacity, they can blow harder in the French horn or whatever. They didn't know, but women weren't making it. Super discouraging and probably a victory for misogynists who are like, see, we told you. <laughs> then somebody had the idea, they're like, wait a second. I wonder if there's something that they can hear. Shoes. They said, I bet they can hear the shoes, the click, click, click of women's heels when they walk in, right? Said, we don't know, but let's try it. So they had them audition in their socks. <laughs> and almost 50% of the, of the, right? What? Of the musicians were women once they couldn't hear it. So for some men, that may have been conscious bias. For some men, they might have been like, I know that's a woman. 
she's not going to be as good. I want to give them the benefit of the doubt and think maybe it was unconscious bias and that maybe a woman judge might have had that same bias because that's borne out in the data too. That sometimes women will get an application if she knows it's from a woman, she rates it lower. Because we're all swimming in the water from the time we're young. We don't choose to, it's just what we inherit, right? Anyway, this is a super encouraging story. I love that these are people who are confronting those biases and that they're not saying, well, I guess this is just the way it is, like the elephant, right? They're saying, no, it doesn't have to be this way. We can do something about it. Okay, here's a couple of other things I love. Do you know this account, <laughs> man who has it all? If you don't know this account, you've got to start following. It's fantastic. Okay, this is another way to flip things, right? And make you go, whoa, why am I surprised when I see this, male investor? Okay, does it even, does it even like, um, do you even notice if someone is like, oh, a female investor, a female tech founder, right? A female doctor, we still do this because it helps us see like, whoa, that's not normal. Here are a few other funny ones. I love when you can use humor. Sometimes there's, there's a time for rage, there's a time for like cold, steely intellect. There's a time for humor. It all works. It's all needed. Male scientist, male composer, male engineer. I love that this is a creator. Also that you can buy these t-shirts and just walking them around does grassroots gender work, right? I love that. I also love this because I've been so inspired walking around just at all. Seven is my first all. Walking around seeing women creators who are no doubt paying their employees equitably and creating what they want to see in the world. The more people do this, the more the culture will change, right? Okay. All right, guys, are you ready? <laughs> are you ready? I'm really ready for this. Okay, the first thing I want you to do is if you're close to your friend next to you, you can answer this question, how have you experienced patriarchy in the bedroom? Or you can write it down, you can burn this after if you want, you can burn the paper. If you've experienced patriarchy in the bedroom, I want you to write a sentence about it. Or say it to your neighbor if you're brave. One thing is I was thinking about how have I and what have I observed in the world, right? One of the things that I realized is that while intimacy, physical intimacy is like the most personal thing, aside from our own thought world, right? Like we have this very intimate um, relationship with a partner. And there has been, this is, I mean, obvious, I guess, but it just hit me again that there has been like macro level interference with the most like private intimate space that we have. And so I wanna do a little quiz. So patriarchal government legislated against birth control, and this is among married couples in the United States until what year? Not in every state, but it was still legislated against in the United States. 1965, 1965. So that was Griswold versus Connecticut. You've probably heard this mentioned in the news. This was the Supreme Court case, and I could tell you the whole story. Actually, I just recorded the episode for the YouTube channel on Griswold versus Connecticut, how that whole thing happened. Um, but anyway, yeah, 1965, so overturning this Supreme Court case means married couples wouldn't have access to birth control. Okay, patriarchal governments failed to protect women against domestic violence. Marital rape was not considered a crime in all 50 states until what year? 1993. That's right. 1993. Again, okay, this wasn't every state, but there was no federal mandate, so states could just do it if they wanted to. 1993, okay? Patriarchal, patriarchal government legislated against same sex sexual activity in some states until what year? 2003. 2003, I'm impressed. Yep. Okay. Patriarchal government legislated against same-sex marriage in some states until 2015. 2015, and we all remember this. 2015, exactly. Okay. The other thing that I okay, the other thing that I I don't have a slide for, but that I was like, oh, the other thing we could write about with in terms of patriarchal institutions 
like exerting influence in our private spaces are religious. And I'm just not gonna go there, but I was looking at pictures of purity balls and purity culture within the Baptist tradition and the LDS tradition and the Catholic tradition and Orthodox Judaism. I mean, every conservative religious tradition I think of has very strong purity culture that has rules that very much influence us in the bedroom according to how we grow up. Okay, so we're gonna talk about now, we're gonna zoom in. So we talked about like big institutions impacting the bedroom, now we're gonna zoom in and talk about more personal things. So although first I just wanna say how I wanna not miss this opportunity to tie that back to Mesopotamia, right? That the state determined that kind of men were central and that men had a say over women's bodies, right? We still see it in our laws and in our attitudes, right? Okay, but now let's talk about a couple other things. We're gonna talk about um, one thing that women learn that impacts how we show up in the bedroom, one thing women learn, one thing that men learn, and one thing that nobody learns. <laughs> One thing that women learn. Do you know this book? <laughs> in the back, it's such an important book. So Peggy Orenstein conducted research in the Bay Area about 10 years ago with high school girls. And she was asking them all kinds of questions about their lives. And she, she saw that, um, do you get this book? Um, the girls' answers when she was doing interviews, if they were talking about their professional goals, competing with boys in the classroom, their ambition and their confidence. She's like, super inspired. This is the most confident generation of women ever. When she started asking them about their sexual activity, she discovered that it was a completely different story and that these girls were engaging in sexual acts and they felt much more free to do so, much more than previous generations. But when they did, it was all about the boys, the guys, sexual experience, his pleasure, and pleasing him. She's like, whoa. And she would ask the girls, like, what's that about? And, and one girl said, there was a quote where she said, uh, I guess that whole, oh, here's what it is. I guess no one ever told me that the strong female image also applies to sex. So why might these empowered young women in the 20 teens, not very long ago, in the Bay Area, why would they be feeling this way? What could be the factors where like, that empowerment hadn't reached their sexual selves yet? Well, Orenstein, Orenstein said two things. She said, there's immense pressure on young women to reduce their worth to their bodies and to see those bodies as a collection of parts that exist for others' pleasure, to continuously monitor their appearance, and to perform rather than to feel sensuality, right? I mean, it resonates, right? And it starts so young. One of the things that I remember the most, if, has anyone read The Second Sex by Simone de Beauvoir? Yes. It's this big, it's humongous. The thing I remember most from that book is Beauvoir interviewing a woman where she said, when was the first time you realized that you were an object that people were looking at? And she said, I remember it so clearly. This is like a French woman in the 30s and, or 40s. She's like, I was little. It was my mom pulling my dress down because she said, men will look at your legs. And suddenly I was like, oh. Because she had inhabited her body as the actor before that. And then suddenly she was herself removed and self-objectified. She was marginalized to herself. And I read that and wept, because I was, I was like, oh, I know, I know. And maybe I don't remember the moment, but pretty close when I was little. This happens to girls in our culture. I think it's worse because of social media, because of the constant, we are constantly thinking of how we are perceived and how we are looked at. We could talk for the whole hour just about that, I feel like. But this is something where, I'm not a sex therapist, but this is something to ask our art. Do we have a sex therapist in the house? I'm, a I'm glad I didn't know that. But I <laughs> <laughs> Correct me if I get something wrong. Okay. But this is a great question to ask ourselves, right? Is to ask ourselves, am I performing? Or am I feeling this? Is it me being the actor? Is it me inhabiting my own body? Or do I feel like I'm looking at myself? 
watching the man look at me if we're talking about heterosexual relationships. Okay. Here's another quote from Ornstein. For years, psychologists have warned that girls learn to suppress their own feelings in order to avoid conflict. Sound familiar? To preserve the peace in friendships and romantic partnerships, whether they hope to attract a boy, whether they hope to attract a boy's interest, sustain it, or placate him, it seemed their partner's happiness was their main concern. I don't want to blame um, religious narratives too much, but when you have a creation narrative where a woman is created to help a man, that's going to have an impact on people's psychology. It just is, right? So the first part of it, I think, is identifying where it comes from, saying, like, this is a real thing, and then we can start to, once we can see it, like Neo seeing the Matrix, right, where you're like, oh, oh my gosh, I see the programming, I see what everything's made of, that is an essential first step, where we see the programming, and then we can start to deprogram ourselves. Okay, and if you're interested in doing the deprogramming, that's another book to take a picture of and buy immediately. And it has a fantastic workbook along with it. And she has a podcast. I'm a big Emily Nagoski fan. Okay. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to talk about what boys learn, what men learn as they grow up in the world. And here's the thing. They learn the same thing. We're all learning it. That men in so many ways are central. Right? That they are primary, that they are created first, that they are the default human, and that the woman is kind of the sidekick, right? That the woman is there to help, that the woman is there to please. We're all learning it, so boys are learning it too. How do they learn it? Sometimes from their parents when they give them the sex talk, right? Oh. <laughs> Sorry, this image was too funny. I was like, I have to. This was too funny. But, like, if we're not trained to do it well, if we don't talk about, if we only talk about, like, the biological function, yeah. inherent in that is that sex equals the male ejaculation. That's what sex is. And if you're not trained of how to talk about, like, that's a very different experience for a woman, for a heterosexual woman. If you're not trained, the default is that they're going to start picking up those other assumptions. I just loved that image. I thought it was so fun. Okay. Where else do boys learn it? They learn it from porn. And what I looked up today, which I hadn't known, was I'm like, okay, I kind of heard that like it's men, obviously, like in the porn industry, bit, um, benefiting from it, but seeing their actual faces, it's like, oh my gosh, it looks like the mafia or something. <laughs> <laughs> they look like crime bosses to me. But anyway, yeah. So porn, I've heard, not a fan, but porn, I have heard, represents um, unrealistic bodies, women with unrealistic bodies doing unrealistic things and liking unrealistic things that actually men want women to like so that men will spend money so that these men will get rich off of those boys and men watching it. It's this type of porn at least, again, I'm not a sex therapist and I don't mean to shame anything, but this type of porn is dangerous and it's a patriarchal racket. So, um, but that's where so many boys are picking up these attitudes that then they will bring, if it's a good boy, like, <laughs> they're good people, but then they bring these expectations to a partnership, to the bedroom, when they grow up. And at the, the very best case scenario, it's just unrealistic. And worst case, it can be dangerous for women. That, that's just one of the influences that is a huge influence on boys and men right now. Okay. Right? What else do men, what do boys and men learn as we're growing up and we all, uh, we all kind of absorb is that who's responsible for preventing pregnancy? We learn that women are. We learn that women are 100% responsible for the burden of avoiding pregnancy. When actually, if men re ejaculated responsibly, they could take that burden and say, like, I can do this so much more easily. And if you don't know about the book, if you are like, the one person at All Summit who doesn't know about the book. Here's the book, go buy it. Gabrielle Blair is here. So, um, but that's a super, super important thing in the bedroom that shows it with that patriarchal attitude um, that we've all absorbed that we can then flip, right? 
<laughs> oh, and the other thing too that ha in this book is that while in our culture we've decided that women have the burden of avoiding pregnancy if an unwanted pregnancy occurs, then suddenly it's the man's right or it's the patriarchal state's right to decide what to do about that unwanted pregnancy, right? So the hypocrisy, it's just not, actually not even logical. Okay, now, okay, we're, we're moving on to the thing that nobody learns about. Not men, not women, not anybody. You ready? It's the clitoris. Nobody learns about it. And we're gonna know, and we're gonna learn why. Okay, so this is a New York Times article that says, half the world has a clitoris, why don't doctors study it? The organ is completely ignored by pretty much everyone, medical experts say, and that omission can be devastating to women's sexual health. You've heard of the wage gap, have you heard of the orgasm gap? Okay, some people are nodding, I'll go through it quickly. So, do we I love it? you. <laughs> <laughs> no one publicly talked about this, so thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, okay, I've yet to talk about the orgasm gap on the podcast. This is like, yes, this is uh, groundbreaking for me. I'm trying it out on you guys. You're my beta, <laughs> my beta group. Okay, so 95% of the time, a straight man will have an orgasm from sexual intercourse. 95, it's like 95 to 99%, okay? Straight men will have an orgasm. It's a little bit less for gay men, 89%. A little less for bisexual men, 88%. 88% of the time to sexual intercourse. Then we have lesbian women at 86% through sex, and then 66% for bisexual women and 65% for straight women, okay? 65% of the time, a straight woman will have an orgasm through sex. And it actually, if it's, I'm just gonna get really real, okay? Without clitoral stimulation, it drops to 18, 18%, okay? So, I mean. <laughs> Actually, we're going to learn why in just a minute. Okay, so Laurie Mintz, who's a, a sex therapist and a writer who wrote, um, what's the title? I have it on here in a second about being clitorate. Like, <laughs> <laughs> clitoris, clitoris, yeah. And take a picture, it's coming up. The number one reason for the orgasm gap is our cultural ignorance of the clitoris. Okay, and I think we can all agree about that, but it's even more stunning than I realized. Okay, well, I'll show you this in a second. <laughs> why, why do we not know about the clitoris? Because it hasn't been studied. And why hasn't it been studied? Because, like we said, with this historical timeline, until very recently, like the last second of history, all doctors have always been men. men. You guys, sorry, but like, is that kind of amazing? <laughs> <laughs> Like, I maybe want to frame it and put it in my bedroom or something. It's <laughs> <laughs> just like so fun. Um, okay, but these doctors, anatomists, have always, were, were always men. Like I said, until like right a second ago, if you look at the timeline. These men, too, these were super, super influential anatomists throughout European history. And really, when an expert writes a book and proclaims something, then it just stays for a while because people don't know to question it. This guy, Galen, I'm looking at the time. Okay, we're good. Galen was the most accomplished medical researcher of antiquity in Greece, and he said that the clitoris was like, okay, oh gosh, I just actually got to quote it because it's too good to not quote. Um, I mean, it's too bad to not quote. Oh yeah, okay. He said that the clitoris was a stunted and immature organ with no real purpose. Oh my God. That's a quote. What? This is this was very and this was really. <laughs> that? I just made a joke. I said, did he have a girlfriend? Right. <laughs> Not for long, probably. <laughs> uh, this was very much in line with Greek thought at the time. Aristotle famously thought that females were mutilated males. That's also a quote. Aristotle. So that's very much like par for the course in the time. In 1543, so jumping way ahead, this is Andreas Vesalius, founder, founder of modern human anatomy. He was Dutch, 
Dutch usually do better, but this guy didn't do great. Um, he said that the clitoris was a useless part of the body. I mean, here's the thing, how would he know? How would he know? Would he like, have one? How would you know? <laughs> Well, yeah, that's true. How would anybody know? And here, and we'll get to why in a sec. Anyway, Sigmund Freud, also real piece of work. This guy, <laughs> <laughs> like really, so bad, so bad. I didn't know that. I read Freud and was just like, okay, like when I was in undergrad. But in my master's degree, I so appreciated my professor. I didn't know this, but he said you really need to look into what Freud did to women. It, it wasn't covered in the syllabus. He said it as I was walking out of class. I was like, oh, thank, I'm really grateful that he said that. Anyway, he said famously that vaginal orgasms were the only type of orgasms and clitoral orgasms were immature, like infantile is what he said. Um, he was wrong and now we know why. <laughs> so by the time this woman, Helen O'Connell, went to medical school, she's Australian, and she found, this was in the 1990s, and she found that in her medical textbook that the clitoris was barely, barely mentioned. Like a sentence, and it was only just the visible part that was mentioned. Well, the penis got two pages of description. You think? Yeah, I think so. Um, and it also, her textbook described that the female anatomy was formed on a baby in utero because of a failure to turn into male parts. And she's, she still has the textbook, the 1990s. Her textbook in medical school, in medical school, in Australia, in the 90s. Is this blowing your mind like it blew my mind? She still has the textbook and she underlined failure and she still has it. Okay, so, and then during medical school, O'Connell noticed like that many penis related surgeries, the surgeons Understandably, and I'm glad, they were really, really careful to not damage sexual function. But they couldn't do that on women patients because they didn't even understand anatomically where the clitoris was, what it did, and she herself observed surgeries and even like physical therapists didn't understand that would crush and damage women's clitoris because they just didn't even know it. It hadn't even been mapped. So she made it her mission to map the clitoris, and she became Australia's first female urologist. And her research finally mapped the clitoris accurate, accurately by doing MRIs on lots of different ages of women, healthy women, and not dead women, or like old, you know, older, old, like very, very old women, or people who had died already. And it was accurately mapped in 2005. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to see what it looks like? Yes. Okay. So, this is the part that people knew about because that's the part you can see. This whole thing, these arms right here, extend nine centimeters into the pelvis. Okay, you guys, I, like, I get a little emotional because I've seen so many images of like genitalia and, and anatomy that show the vagina and the urethra and you can see all the labia and all of that I knew about. Never have I seen this. And I guess I had because it hadn't, it wasn't even known until 2005. If you open up a human body, you have a very large organ that nobody knew about. Okay, here's like just a practical piece of information. When people talk about clitoral orgasms versus vaginal orgasms, there's no such thing as just a vaginal orgasm, okay? It's because the clitoris is getting bumped through the vaginal walls. Every orgasm is a clitoral orgasm, okay? Nobody knows this. Nobody's talked about it, so you're welcome. <laughs> It is a, I love this sentence, 
It is a sprawling underground kingdom of crackling nerves and blood pumping vessels. I would say queendom, actually. <laughs> Underneath the nub called the glans clitoris, a plump wishbone shape encircles the vagina with arms that flare out up to nine centimeters into the pelvis. And all the parts beneath the surface are made of erectile tissue, meaning they swell with blood when aroused to become even bigger. And it has two to three times more nerve endings than the penis. Okay. Wow. Hey. So that's really important to understand. The movement to destigmatize the clitoris now has a lot of ambassadors. There are a lot of artists making art. This is a huge sculpture. People are making all kinds of art. I fully expect someone to bring these earrings to Alt Summit, earrings to Alt Summit next year. I want to see your booth. I want to see multicolored earrings. This is the book I was talking about before, Becoming Clitorate by Dr. Uh, Lori Mintz. Make sure to pick that up. Understanding the clitoris benefits everyone. Everyone should know how the human body works, and we have to destigmatize it. Boys and men, trans people, cisgender people, girls and women, every human needs to know about our bodies, okay? Destigmatize and just understand the anatomy and how everything works. Here's the other thing. The men I know really want to be generous sexual partners. And we know that a lot of divorces are caused by sexual tension and sexual dissatisfaction. So closing the orgasm gap benefits women, obviously. It also benefits their, their partners. It benefits marriages. It benefits the whole human family to have everybody functioning at the optimal level. I also want to say, I'm just going to share one last thing. So this, The Second Sex by Simone de Beauvoir, just to bring it back to like the primary person and the secondary person, that's a really, really great book for feminist theory if you want to read more about this. But as, I was looking for images on Adam and Eve when I was doing the religion part, I, I came upon this one and I kind of loved it because they both look so sad. You know what I mean? Patriarchy harms everybody. It harms relationships, it harms men in a way that we could spend a whole other hour on that we didn't even touch on. But it harms everybody. And I mean, it's not men's fault. It's not men's fault that the penis isn't hard to find. That's not their fault. And none of the systems, it's not. And none of the systems that we talked about, it's nobody's fault today. You know, the, the systems that were invented thousands of years ago, it's nobody's fault today. We're not responsible for what we inherit. But we are responsible for what we do with what we inherit. Right? In our lives and for the, the benefit of future generations. And I am going to close with some quotes from Barbie. Because what I love, and I, one of the things I did really love about the Barbie movie is how, again, it flips it. Every time they said Barbie and Ken, where you have Barbie's primary and Ken's the sidekick, it, for me it was Adam and Eve. It's the, the primary and the secondary. And when Ken is sobbing, saying, it can't, it can't be just Ken. It's Barbie and Ken. It's Barbie and Ken. There can't be just Ken. It can't be just Eve. It's, it's always been Adam and Eve. And I wanted to end with these quotes where she says, what if it's Barbie and it's Ken? What if it's Adam and it's Eve? What about it's each human being just being themselves fully actualized, standing in their sovereignty and coming at things from a place of love for everybody else? No Barbie or Ken should be living in the shadows. And I want to end because I know I shared a, kind of, a lot of kind of disheartening information today, but I want to share we can't give up because even if we can't make it perfect, we could make it better.